welcome to the People, Place and Nature podcast. Today we're joined by Judy Ling Wong, who has been behind an enormous amount of work in helping engage people with the environment. She's the Honorary President of the Black Environment Network, an artist, community organiser and activist, and through this work has helped untold numbers of people value, appreciate, understand and engage with the natural world. I've had the pleasure to work with Judy on a number of occasions, including speaking together at UN forums and advising organisations, and I found her wisdom invaluable, and I hope you do too. But first, it's important to remember sustainability doesn't just relate to the environment. It relates to your finances as well. That's why we have switched to Beans Accountants. Beans operate on a package system, so you always know where you stand. We halved our accountancy costs by moving to them, and one of our associates just reduced theirs by two thirds. And with free tax advice and accountancy support, you cannot go wrong. So make sure you check out Beans Accountants in the description below. So Judy, absolutely wonderful to see you again. Thank you so much for joining us and for having us here. Last time I saw you, we were in Abu Dhabi um, at the UN World Urban Forum, just as we were going into the coronavirus crisis. And it was before it really was starting to affect the UK. So I remember we were there and um, the event was still very busy, but there was, I think, 6,000 Chinese people missing, which obviously made a huge dent in the total number of people there. Um, and we were starting to think, oh, maybe actually there is something serious going on here. And then shortly <laughs> after we got back to the UK and everything was locked down. So um, absolutely wonderful to see you in person again. And you've been talking a lot now about there being multiple crises. So I was just wondering maybe if you could talk a bit about the different crises we're facing and, and what your views on them are. Well, you know, now the world really has entirely changed since that last time we saw each other to be among all those people, without mm -hmm. thinking about masks or yeah. anything, for the last time yeah. at the World Urban Forum, it was really something it to, was. to look back. And since then, we've been hit by the combination of really three crises. So the first one, of course, is COVID, mm -hmm. which has changed our lives and continues to change our lives. And then the second one is climate change emergency, which has come to the fore very much since then. Mm -hmm. The voices are louder. Mother Nature has good timing, is <laughs> throwing wildfires and floods mm -hmm. at the world, especially at the Western nations who hold mm -hmm. so much power just before COP26. That's perfect timing if Mother Nature has any consciousness at all. <laughs> And the third thing, of course, is Black Lives Matter with mm. the death of George Floyd. We have a wave of emotion that has gone across the world mm. and has given remarkably to an impetus across the world for diversity, equality and inclusion. Now that means that we're more positioned to begin that journey. We need to move fast. Mm. about the global dimensions of everything we do. And COVID has said we're all interconnected, local and global, which has been mumbled, but not very, very seriously taken. It's more seriously taken now. And then same with climate change, local and global. The fact that I work in multiculturalism, and this is more important than ever, because, you know, when we think about the people we call ethnic minorities in the UK, they're actually the ethnic majorities of the world. Mm -hmm. Only 10% of the world is white. Mm -hmm. So we have to have those skills, that open heart and the skills to really work out things together in a collaborative way, rather than a way that is sort of antagonistic to each other. We need that just to survive. So there are opportunities and we've covered, you know, a lot of people have said that the essentials of life are now much more in front of their minds and hearts than before. They've seen that there's lots of things they can do without that does not make any difference. So this is an opportunity, even for government with taxes and so on. People say, you know, suddenly my middle class friends are finding all this money in their bank account because they don't go out to eat, they don't go to the theater, they don't go to the And they can see how much money they actually have compared to people who have no money yeah. and struggling. And all these realizations can make a shift, be more open to sharing mm -hmm. and caring for each other. So as much as we're in this collapse and very dark moments of the world, I think there are glimpses of movement towards the lightning at the end of the tunnel. Oh, yeah, I completely agree. 
I think there's kind of a call for collective action, isn't there? And even if it's not a physical call as such, people can sense they have to do something. And I'm seeing this with a lot of, lot of my friends, you know, some of them have worked in professions that, or been in positions where they've not really cared or been that bothered. They've had an interest, but not really in the environment and a lot of these things. And now there's kind of this, as part of this social crisis, this kind of a crisis of purpose, I think. And these things are giving people purpose. You know, they're giving them a reason to, to rethink their lives and restructure what they do and think about how they can actually get involved to support other people and help tackle some of these problems. You know, as much for themselves as for other people as well, you know, it has to be said. Um, it's not all, you know, giving as such in some cases, but, um, you know, there's definitely a shift taking place and I'm seeing it more and more with people that I would never have expected to, to see it from, which is really good. Yes, it is. And I think the deep realizations of various things you know, is important for a lot of people to experience, as awful as COVID is. Mm -hmm. This whole thing of freedom without discipline, mm -hmm. people are finding out it doesn't work for them. Mm -hmm. They too can get ill. They can't just think that they can do anything they want. So there is society being forced to wake up to things as well as willing Mm -hmm. to search for something else. So a lot of us are rethinking our lives with a kind of urgency that we never had before. And more clarity, there's more information. And this is really necessary because, as I said, decades ago, we talked about the idea of sharing. Because let's look at the facts. We talk about food insecurity and all that. But for decades, we've had enough food for the whole world. Mm -hmm. The whole problem is refusal to share. Mm -hmm. being terrified that we gave something away that we would not get it back. So we've got to get rid of these concepts and begin to know that even if we have to do without a little bit, we are okay. There are things essential in life that make us happy, like your new baby. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. It definitely makes me very happy. <laughs> yeah, I've just had a baby, so a month today. So it's been a very exciting and tiring past month. So. But there's a lot of joy in the world, it's just finding it, isn't it? And people find it in different places. Yes, and I think that in a way COVID has enabled us to see where the real joy is. Mm -hmm. And being able to see where the real joy is helps to take us through the dark elements. So this balance, constantly looking for the balance. You can scare people, but you've got to delight people mm -hmm. at the same time. And then we will get through it. And it is all there. There's no lack of beauty. There's no lack of joy alongside everything. There is. And I think as well, things are becoming much more accessible. So you mentioned food security, for example. Again, some of my friends who are kind of getting more involved in this environmental world now, they're looking at it a lot from sort of a hydroponics and aquaponics side of things, you know, which is obviously very you know, futuristic, it seemed a few years ago, form of food production. But actually, the technology's made it much more accessible. You can do a huge amount in such a small space. And actually, it's not that difficult to do. So a lot of people are finding that actually some of these solutions are really within hand's reach. And a lot of the things we need to do are things we did generations ago that we've kind of, our society has shifted away from. You know, we'll talk about it later, but you know, more hands-on things like forestry, farming, all of those things are gonna see a real resurgence or at least a change in the way they work. Um, and there's a huge opportunity for people to do a job that's incredibly rewarding that you can actually see. And that's something we've lost in the digital world. We've lost tangible results from what you do, I think. You know, it's all well and good seeing 3D models and all this type of thing, but it's not the same as standing and breathing and seeing a space in person. You don't have the same feel or sense, sensory experience as you otherwise would do. The 21st century lifestyle can, if people are not careful, become very bleak. Mm. It's dominated by work, there's a lot of pressure, there's IT, it takes us into, into places where nature isn't and so on. So we have to be more aware. And I think that the switching on of this awareness is really important. Again, COVID exaggerated. People were just going for green spaces because mm -hmm. instead of taking it for granted, they saw that, you know, we need to take care of it, we need more of it and so on. So this kind of balancing out of people's lives so that their connection to community and to nature among professionals who are very overworked and so on has got to be there so that we as a society are much more poised to doing things as a community and in engagement and having ideas that really make us dream 
You know, you talk about, for example, I'm one of the co-founders of London National Park City. Mm. The idea of not a national park, but a national park city. When people first heard it, they thought, what do you mean, you know? National parks are sort of way out there in the middle of nowhere. What do you mean a national park city? But you can actually create a city that's really, really green. And we've got to have this sort of solution with the coming of mega cities across the world. Mm -hmm. If we don't do that, we'll really have a world in which more and more people have very bleak built environments. And of course, you guys who are landscape professionals and so I have a key role to play. And I think a unique role. Mm -hmm. As a profession, landscape professionals are challenged with broad bases. Mm -hmm. Many sectors, you work with forestry, you work with city planners, you work in housing, you work with education, you work with informing people. You work with a whole range of things about people's needs and so on. But in a way, you are ahead of the game, you know, mm -hmm. in approaching this kind of integrated view that we need across all professions. Other professions who don't do it inside their professions have to now work at it to build those links with other sectors. They do. It's been, it's been lost. You know, a lot of professions would have had many hats. You know, traditionally, it would have been architects. They would have done a lot of the planning and the landscape side of things, too. Um, but now it's sort of broken out into separate kind of professions. Um, and it's caused us to become very siloed. But luckily, um, it's what, as you say, where landscape really comes into its own is we have a really key role in coming in and articulating the narrative of a lot of these professions. That's the way I like to refer to it as, because we're not coming in and necessarily dictating what needs to be done. We're coming in and listening to what all of the parties are saying and to coming to, and trying to design a solution which works for everyone, or at least has you know, some trade-offs that everybody can accept. And a lot of it's about integrating natural and man-made systems um, and yeah, working with communities and all sorts of different people. Mm -hmm. And that has huge value because people feel empowered and you know, we end up with a solution that has multiple benefits, opposed to it just having its one function. It now has multiple functions and supports things nearby and ties in with things nearby much more than it used to. You know, it's about looking beyond the site and things like that too. How do we look at re restoring and reconnecting the surrounding areas? It's, it's really important. And it's, been a, it's a profession that's been around for a while, but it's quite young really. Um, but now it's really coming into its own. And you know, it, in my view, I'm, I'm a bit biased, but I, I think it's one of the most important professions of the future because it's the only one that's going to really mitigate. It can both mitigate and, you know, the impacts of and help prevent climate change because we can reduce carbon, we can store carbon, and we can restore the landscape, which will help us in turn mitigate impacts by, you know, building better flood defences, flood storage, and all that type of thing, and doing it in subtle ways. Some of the best design is the most subtle, you know. So there's a lot of huge opportunity for the profession. Absolutely, I can't agree more. When I first founded alongside other people, Black Environment Network, we put out a challenge to the environmental sector. The environmental sector in 1987 was very much about purely nature conservation. They didn't think about people at all. I mean, they didn't even think about white people, never mind ethnic <laughs> minorities. We were seen as some kind of very strange kettle of fish, suddenly ethnic minorities coming forward, saying they want to be part of the mainstream and, and that they had needs. Mm -hmm. Because the nature conservation sector thought that people are there to volunteer for nature. If you're not interested in volunteering for nature, goodbye, <laughs> white, black or otherwise, you yeah. know. And when we talk about a two-way street view of nature, of people for nature and nature people, they couldn't understand it at all. Mm -hmm. That we have other things to bring, that there are cultural dimensions of nature that are inspiring, different ways of seeing nature, that we actually bring and integrate things. So we, our challenge was this, that there's no such thing as a purely environmental initiative. Mm -hmm. A so-called purely environmental initiative is one that has neglected its cultural, social, and economic dimensions. Mm -hmm. Now, those four words are interchangeable. You can say there's no such thing as a purely economic initiative and name the other dimensions. But we're coming around to seeing this after all these years, that it doesn't work mm -hmm. to be siloed, but we also need to be very pragmatic about why this is so, because actually it's very difficult for experts the more expert you are, the more you know what it means to really know your sector. Mm -hmm. 
to work in such a way that is appropriate. So experts know the importance of experience and skills in such a way so that when they are asked to enter another sector, to talk to another sector, they're really aware they don't know anything. Mm -hmm. So that means that although they're confident in their own profession, they have a severe lack of confidence entering another conversation with another kind of expertise. But we can all get over this. We can mm -hmm. have to invest that time and that commitment to acquiring what I call the minimal critical mass of being able to speak meaningfully in another sector. Once you get that, my God, away you go. Mm -hmm. And this is what we keep drawing back from. We have to make that effort to cross that bridge so that we link everything. You know, once upon a time in Leonardo's time, inside Leonardo was an artist, a philosopher, a scientist, you name it, he did it. He was at the cutting edge of everything within one lifetime. This is no longer possible. Mm -hmm. We cannot even get to the edge of knowledge within our own expertise. So this is very difficult. So the idea of the group mind has to come to the fore. We have to collaborate. We have to build that meaningful conversation to rescue us all from the mm. silo stuff that takes us down, down to cul-de-sacs. You know, we end up in a dead end. And very often, I say to some experts, I said, you know, you're struggling with this problem. Guess what? The answer is in the next sector. Yeah. It is, and it, it's, it's no doubt someone's come across that bridge and crossed it before, you know. And I was saying a long time ago that it's, you know, it's important to know where you stand, but it's also important to know who stands next to you. And we, that's what we've lost. We've lost what professions should be, we should be allied with and, and working and collaborating with on these projects. And the big challenge is, you know, a lot of the time, it, it's sometimes difficult to know who has those expertise. Um, and when you do find them, in the real world, the challenge can often be, you know, resourcing and things like that. You know, some big projects might not have the experts you might need beside you. And there needs to be more of a kind of mixed uh, design team, I would say, within companies and things. Whereas a lot of companies, I mean, my company is an example of this. We just do landscape architecture. Um, but actually, you know, a lot of companies now have got landscape and ecology and arboriculture and all this type of thing. And there's real value in that because you've got those people with you. I mean, we haven't been in offices for a while now. But the advantage of having these offices is you have people next to you to ask, oh, actually, hey, what do you think about this? What's your opinion on this? Um, and you can get that free advice flowing very quickly and just have a quick discussion over a coffee and resolve you know, an awful lot of problems and get some really innovative ideas to, to tackle these things, which is not always possible on some, some projects. So it's very important to try and build those relationships and you know, get clients to understand that they need to appoint these wide teams of people to be able to get the views that's needed. Because as you say, it's very difficult to understand your own profession, let alone all the others that stand next to you. And it's about making work accessible as well. You know, one of the, one of the challenges I've found is people do great work, and rightly so, you know, they want some recompense for that. But a lot of the time, people can't necessarily afford it, or they, so they can't access it. And then you end up with people wanting to do good, but actually they can't access the information to necessarily do what they, what they want to. So you end up in a position where People are trying to do this form of working, but we put barriers in our own way, um, which can make things very challenging. And we need to be a bit more compassionate in terms of giving these things and making them available, I think. Absolutely. You know, and a lot of these professions, you know, the professionals are actually quite well paid. It's mm. very important that we get an increasing number of people who are community minded, who are professionals, mm. because professionals are people. Mm. You know, they should identify with community. They should have some sort of pet project somewhere that they're really passionate about and give work away and so on. This is the way to build things as citizens and as professionals. And to, within organizations, I think as a strategy, a strategy even for organizations, they should have at least one person in their team who is in a way professional at being in between. Yeah. And it is such fun. I mean, this is something I think that people need to know that it's so enjoyable to cross sectors and to learn and to have that element in their lives, really. It is. It's vital. And some companies are really starting to do well. I've seen quite a lot of engineering companies lately who have got one landscape architect to sort of be the in-between between all the projects, just to come in and cast an eye going, oh, well, have you thought of that? And you see the value. You often don't realize the value because a lot of it's quite often common sense. But when you're focusing on a specific problem, you might not necessarily notice some of the other things that are happening. 
And I was involved with a housing project a while ago, and um, we were brought in very, very late into the project. You know, and they gated off the community park. Well, not gated off, they fenced off the community park. And we sort of came in and said, well, you know there's a park there, right? And they were sort of saying, no. You know, because on Google, it was just a patch of earth or grass. <laughs> and actually, they built a park there. And now this new development is basically blocking access from the wider housing estates to this park. So they don't have to go all the way around the new estate oh, to get goodness. to this park that was otherwise a few hundred meters away. Well, not even that, probably a hundred meters away. So, you know, you end up in situations like that where simple things get missed, where people are so focused on their specific element that they're missing some of this wider context and not looking at it. Mm -hmm. You know, it should have been picked up by a number of people. Um, and we put forward a case saying, look, obviously, this is really obvious. You should have a gate or something in here. Um, but they'd already submitted it to planning and it had been approved, so they weren't going to change their plans. So, you know, you end up in a position where your hands are tied and, and what can you do, you know? All you can do is say, well, actually, maybe just put a gate in there anyway. And you suggest it on all of your things, but sometimes people are very much, no, it's too late, we're just going to leave as it is. And there's this real kind of reluctance to respond, which causes a lot of issues. And, um, you know, but again, if people were involved earlier who could spot these things, you know, all it takes is one person to look at these things, as you say, for a big developer, you know, in, in a housing development company. You just need one person to quickly look over the plans and go and visit the site and see these things. But especially with COVID, some of that's not been happening. You know, people haven't been visiting and more and more of it's being done digitally. So you lose, as you're saying, you know, this community feel and the character of the place and you lose a lot of that's being lost. But positively, <laughs> it's changing. So, you know, we're starting to tackle these things much more. And as I say, companies are starting to get these people in um, to start tackling this. But it, it has been a big problem. You know, there are two things that need to happen, isn't it? There needs to be organizational development. This mm. sort of attitude of both linking up and with community on the agenda. On the community side in the UK, we're very lucky. We have the best, the most developed voluntary sector in the world. Mm. In London itself, we have something like over 120,000 groups. <laughs> it is wow. just absolutely astonishing. And it is a kind of stability of, of the country as well. You know, in a country where if the government doesn't do something, over dinner you can get three people together and form an association, and it's a legal entity. Then you begin to do the things you want in the way you want. Now this produces a terrifically diverse, innovative, active, and stable society, mm -hmm. and it's a real strength. But having said that it's a real strength, it's also uneven. You know, if I look at some of the really great community groups I've come across, especially in relationship to working with your professionals, there's a group called the Bankside Open Spaces Trust in Southern. Mm -hmm. Now, they worked in such a way over decades of their community that when there's a real issue of concern, they have the capacity and the connections to knock on every door. <laughs> that is an amazing capacity. Most groups do not have that. Mm -hmm. So their methodology, their history of how they did, did it and so on. And yet, although they recognize they never had the capacity to share that experience. These are the weak points in our infrastructure. They should have been given money to enable people to come in, see how they work, learn from them, and reproduce great examples. And some of this sort of thing at, at the moment being set up like London National Park City, it's the same. Mm -hmm. London National Park City is very aware of what an immensely important idea it is. It has a very simple strap, strap line, you know, greener, healthier, wilder. You know, can anybody not identify with that? And this amazing concentration on the needs of the city is that instead of a national park, which is all about nature being beautiful and so on, a national park city is a city that pays attention equally to outstanding nature and the potential for more wild nature in the built environment. It's the second part that is so wonderful, that we can get more and more of this. And again, the grassroots movement, and of course now, what is it? a facility for mm -hmm. landscape professionals, for people to get inside a massive web of people who have these things in the front of their minds in an era when increasingly in research and in policy and so on, we're linking health, well-being and environment together. Mm -hmm. So it is a resource 
as well as a great grassroots movement for people to enjoy and to reimagine their local environment. Absolutely. And how did, how did the National Park City come around? How did it, why was it formed? Who was involved and, you know, what sort of activities is taking place now? Because it was declared, when was it declared? Actually? 2019, July. July 2019. So what's kind of progressed since then? How is it, how is it all going? It took six years, six which years is actually launched. for something like quick. that is very fast. <laughs> it is quite fast, yeah. <laughs> people saw, some people were not in this sort of field, said, six years. I said, no, it's really fast. Yeah. yeah. But um, yes, like every voluntary initiative, is people talking like you and me, a mm. group of you sitting there and saying, oh, you know, there's this problem and so on, and someone having dinner together and so on, saying, what if we did this? And then, if you have the alchemy of three or four people of like mind suddenly thinking, this is really important, we've got to do something about it. It's like the way Ben was set up, Black Environment Network. was the same, people sitting around dinner saying, how come we don't see any ethnic minorities in the environmental sector? And someone else sort of says, yeah, you're quite right. And someone says, why don't we do something about it? And the issue was so important to that small group of people that it would not go away. Mm -hmm. It keeps happening happening that conversation over more dinner, more coffee, and so on. And people sit there and say, yes, we want to do it, but how? This is mm. a search for a solution, especially when it is very new as a model. So it took, again, months, years before suddenly something happens because you keep talking about it, you talk about it to other people and so on. And one of the groups of people inside that first steering group, of which I was one, for Black Environment Network was Amanda Bennett. She worked in NCVO, the National Council of Voluntary Organizations. And one day she was talking to the, the chief exec, and the chief exec at that time, luckily, was an ethnic minority, <laughs> Usha Patel. And Usha said, oh, that's interesting. She says, yeah, ethnic minorities, urban environment, nation. That's quite interesting. Why don't you have a desk? <laughs> we'll give your group a desk, and that's how it started. In those days, NCVO was very, very keen about small groups. They no longer do this. They only deal with nationals now. But in those days, if they spotted a small, innovative, interesting project, one of the things they did was give you a desk. <laughs> Free. Come into your desk, use the professionals in the building, talk to us, do what you like. If you have a little bit of money, we'll give it to you. And the, the thing of how I came to be part of this was interesting because I was still working as an artist. Mm -hmm. And um, I came onto the steering group and so on. At one point, I talked to the then chair, Julian. I said, I said, Julian, you know, I'm not really the steering type, I'm the doing type. Mm -hmm. And Julian says, well, then, if we ever got any money, why don't you go and do it? And that's exactly what happened. And our first lot of money came from NCVO. You know what they did? Again, they were creative and they were legitimate. They said, well, urban people, ethnic minorities. And Amanda worked in the, in the urban unit. Mm -hmm. And Usha says, well, you know, we got a little budget. At the end of every month, if we have any money, you can have it. <laughs> so I used to work one day a week when there was money for one month, two days a week if there was more money. No days a week, <laughs> there was nothing left in the budget. But that is how we started. Mm -hmm. And because we started and we talked about it and what we were trying to do and so on, people come in who were actually interested. And the then English nature, one of the people who was very well known, he's passed away now, George Barker, he was the person who actually started the idea of urban wildlife. Mm -hmm. And when he heard about what we we're doing, he said, Urban, wildlife, nature, ethnic minorities, well, worth a little experiment, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And so one day I remember so clearly, I was sitting at my desk in NCVO, and George Barker appeared with Charlie Ruggioni, who ran the grant scheme, and they said, we've come to give you a grant. It's three months, show us what you can do. Mm -hmm. So I had a full-time job for three months, oh, wow. and in three months flat, we set up the very first three regional forums, hmm. London, Birmingham, and Bristol. 
And George and English Nature were so impressed that they then gave us a one-year contract to expand it and to do and to lay down the basis for Black Environment Network. We never looked back. Mm -hmm. Never looked back. We did so much. We got other grants and so on, and we just built on everything we did. Because there was a need. That is the other thing about groups forming. So if you form around something with a real need, and you are new and you're looking for a way, you'll be funded mm -hmm. sooner or later. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of people looking for it now as well, aren't there? A lot of you know, corporations trying to do their you know, take the responsibility seriously and invest money in places or just greenwash and put money places anyway. Um, <laughs> you know, so there is a lot of opportunity for these things. You know, if you have an idea, now's a really good time to try and take it forward. Exactly, exactly. We have to build our own, own future, you know. We talk about green infrastructure and, and things like that at organisational level, but people have agency. You know, near here in Foxhall, there's a three or four streets which I've talked about a lot of times. Where, because we're in the London borough of Lambeth, Lambeth is a bit wild, but it's also innovative because it is a bit wild, mm -hmm. not mad on administration and all that. They allow people to do innovative things. And one of the things they allow is, for example, guerrilla gardening. Mm -hmm. They actually say to you, oh, well, if you get into your mind, you're going to do something somewhere. So go and do it, but ring us up and show us what you've done. If we suddenly like it, we will ring up the contractor in charge of that area and they will leave it alone. Hmm. So in that area in Vauxhall, people have done all sorts of things like pick up paving stones and plant bushes in the pavement and so on. And they have climbers on the buildings, they've got huge trees. There are five back gardens that have been put together into being a little square. Hmm. All this oh, wow. sort of innovative stuff. And when you walk into that area, they allow their garden plants from front gardens to spill onto the pavement. Mm. They have huge garbage bins and things in which they plant trees and bushes and line <laughs> them up in front of their houses. <laughs> so that, and Lambert sort of says to themselves, well, you know, as long as you can get a buggy through and a wheelchair through, what's the odds? Let them take over the pavement. Mm. People have benches mm -hmm. outside. They've cleaned the streets as their outdoor space and greening it. And when you walk into that area, right outside, three streets away, is the A3 with traffic roaring past. When you go into that, that area, it's a green oasis. There's bird song everywhere. Mm -hmm. And this is a residential area of old houses, like in many areas of London. It shows that in any residential area where there's hardly any traffic, the cars are your cars, the pedestrians are your friends and family, you can take over the streets. And in the weekends or so on, they come out with table tennis tables into the street and just take over. Mm -hmm. But this sort of example of what you can do with a residential area, it should be happening all over London. And recently I've been talking to Natural England and the Woodland Trust and I said, if you look at an area like that and what they have done and how green it is and so on, tree plant, plant planting, planting between trees, or, bushes and all this other stuff. London is the largest urban forest in the world. And when foresters look at the urban forest, they talk about canopy. They never look at the forest floor. Hmm. It is time to think about every area with potential as the forest floor of our urban forest. Places like the green areas of social housing. In many boroughs, you have more acreage in social housing in terms of green areas than public parks and gardens, but mm. they're of the poorest quality. They can become wildflower meadows and thrill people right outside their windows. You can have allotments with food growing for people. You can have seating for people who sit in these areas. It would transform our city and really build that vision of mm -hmm. a national park city. Exactly, so all of that's fed into you know, driving the initiative and getting the National Park City moving. So what, what have you been up to since the National Park City was kind of launched? Are they, because there's a lot of new policies coming in, you know, we work on a lot of projects in London, nearly all the projects we're working on, I think, actually I think all of them now have green roofs, you know, big green roofs, much more public green space. We're getting, you know, we're, we're, we really push, obviously, to try and do the best thing, best we can. And we're trying to reclaim the edges of pavements against the road, but, 
swales and things into catching clean water, which means we can plant trees along there as well and separate pedestrians from the road, which obviously means the air pollution is less for those pedestrians and things too. You know, so we're doing more and more projects like that. And now, luckily, it's being demanded more and more, which is brilliant. And the council are really paying a lot more attention to it. So obviously there's that side, but have there been a lot more community groups spring up and that type of thing as well? Is there any, do you know of any other big changes that are taking place? Absolutely. I mean, people have come together and been inspired. One of the, the activities around London National Park City is to bring people together. We have fairs and things mm -hmm. where people come together, have stalls, people wander around, make contact, talk to each other. And recently, London National Park City did a project called 100 Voices. Mm -hmm. And after it's finished, it's all on the website. You can go and look, look so you can see individuals, not just groups, but individuals doing things off their own bed. They're all examples that allow people to say, wow, I'm just like him. Hmm. You know, there's a person like me doing this. If he can do it or she can do it, I can do it. Isn't that true? And this kind of identification spreads. So they also had 100 voices from abroad mm -hmm. across the world so that the diversity of situations has been really inspiring. People see things differently. So different ideas come across from growing out of the circumstances of your own city. And London National Park City has recently just launched the, the little book as to what is the journey to becoming a National Park City. Because it is a journey you need to sort of find yourself because your circumstances are different. Your, Legal systems are different, your city systems are different, and so on. London National Park City decided that the basis for it to be declared a London National Park City is the mandate of the voices of the people. Mm -hmm. And the mandate in terms of political structure at the lowest rung is wards instead of boroughs, small wards, and so on. And they represent the people of London. So part of the campaign was very political. We had a team that went out along those six years. It took six years to arrive at the point where we had over 50% of London wards signed up to say they support London National Park City. Hmm. Oh, wow. So it has a political dimension, a campaigning dimension, a grassroots education, inspiration, innovation dimension to it, linking up across sectors and so on. And th this is very interesting because it pulls the two dimensions together at city level and at community level and having other structures which can give people more experience and more influence. And, and finding the way is so interesting. For example, one of the recent initiatives is London City Rangers. And these rangers are not the traditional rangers. It's another innovation. You can be an artist, you can be a teacher, you can be a social worker, you can be an architect, you can be a landscape designer, and you can come and become a city ranger for London National Park City. It's not a full-time job. You're committed to only a few hours mm -hmm. in a month. And in those few hours, you do things that you want in your own way. Mm. And in that way, the multiplicity of approaches again multiplies and at some time will be shared and will give people many, many more solutions to what they can do locally as well. Yeah, definitely. And I think, you know, going back to the, the local side of things, um, having those people is so important because there's so much evidence around normality, especially with, with COVID, about the importance of seeing people, seeing people regularly. And if you have people caring for these spaces, like the streets you mentioned, where they've got bins filled with trees and all this type of thing, just seeing people, if you're, an old, if you're an elderly resident especially, if you, if you can see those people outside looking up at those trees, it gives you an opportunity to go and talk to them and maybe help them and even just seeing them has a huge benefit on mental health, seeing these things being done and, and activities, especially positive activities, people caring for things. And as, you know, as we've always talked about, you know, people take ownership of these things too, don't they? So suddenly they, you're less likely to get youths coming and kicking everything over because their friend's mum's done it or something like that, you know. Um, and all of these things add up and they make a much more cohesive community. And, um, you know, a lot of the problems we're facing, you know, societal problems, you know, from crime, um, which are some of these other awful acts, a lot of it, I think, comes down to just the, the loss of community. You know, I, I've recently moved to Birmingham and we live in quite a small close in Birmingham, but everyone's very friendly. People are just coming and talking to each other. And, um, you know, we found from moving from the south, where we were before, which is a bit more 
bit more rural, um, and from living in other cities before, that there's a very strong community there. A lot of people, a lot of groups you go to, they all kind of know each other. You know, we went, I went boxing at the gym, and then I went to Salsa, and the guys from the gym who were doing the boxing, you know, big, big guys are there at Salsa, and you think, oh my God, you know, it's just, there's lots of small little high streets and things where everyone kind of gets on, and you know, you, you end up bumping into these people everywhere. And you realize that actually it's still, even though it's a very big city, it's very small communities, which is, which is really nice. And you see it with lots of the small businesses and bakeries popping up, you know, supporting each other. Um, and I think just the way we, we used to do things is changing. And it's really important that it does. You know, a friend of mine's um, got a small bakery in Birmingham, really probably the best bakery I've ever been to. Um, and they do lots of pop-ups with lots of other small companies, you know, other restaurants, other bakeries that may specialize in other areas. So even though you could potentially argue they're competition, they do a lot, a lot of things to support one another. You know, and when COVID hit and my business slowed down, we did deliveries for them, you know, and all of this type of thing. So you end up with a lot of these small little businesses coming in and helping each other. And that's really important, you know, having that cohesive community that can support each other um, and be dynamic and respond to things. Whereas traditionally, I think we've, we've lost that, or at least a lot of that. Yes, there's such good examples in the UK because the voluntary sector is strong. Mm. But still, we need to multiply, scale up all these things. You know, things have to multiply. And London National Park City, as I said, it had now just published a little book about the journey towards a national park city in your own city, in your own way, and that's very important. Mm. And it's aiming to have 25 national park cities across the world by 2025. Glasgow is going to become one. Oh, wow. you know, there are going to be more both in the UK and, and abroad as well. But I think the, the international and the local, you see, all these levels has got to work together, especially with COP26 and interconnectedness. And in 2017, the Director Secretary General of the UN said at a very high level meeting at UN Habitat, she actually said, you know, that the future of sustainability is a battle that will be fought won or lost in the cities. Mm. The cities exaggerate everything. They exaggerate poverty, mm -hmm. they exaggerate the gap between the rich and the poor and so on. And as part of that, the UN Habitat so astutely brought together the themes of nature and human settlements. And they actually very much promote this new urban agenda, which is policy document, which is about above all, attending to those that are left behind. Mm -hmm. In this world and in cities, we cannot afford to leave people behind. To society, it's a dangerous thing to do. To leave people behind in such a way they got nothing to lose, mm -hmm. that's when there's real danger for society. But through movements from the grassroots, paying attention, so rebuilding, so these people have energy. When I worked for 27 years as a director of Ben in communities, what I saw is that the most deprived communities had the most displaced energy, but there was energy. So one of the things that happened is when there's better things to do, when there's more satisfying things to do, when you meet more friends, build friendships and community and so on, you give up negative things. And I found that all those deprived people we worked with, when they had something that they wanted to do, they had double the energy of the middle classes. Mm -hmm. It was frustrated, held back energy, waiting to be released. So these are things we need to realize. And that's why grassroots movement, things that show people like you doing meaningful things that you can see are so very important. Mm -hmm. That reaching out and roping them in to see that the potential is actually fulfilled. Definitely, definitely, it's really important. And you know, there's so much, as we said, already said, there's so much to say on it. It's the importance of making sure people are included, making sure they contribute and giving them, you know, purpose. I think, as we've said already, I mean, there's a huge lack of purpose at the moment and it's such a clear need for it now. People can really step up and take charge. I mean, um, I hate to use myself as an example, but you know, I'm relatively young in my career. Um, you know, I'm 28, when I was 20, one, I think I became a trustee of our professional body, maybe slightly older, maybe 22. Um, <laughs> and then at 23, I was um, representing the UK on the World and European Council for Landscape Architecture. You know, that could never have happened a few years ago, even a few years before then. But things are shifting so much now 
there's such opportunity for people to step up. And a lot of these professions that we really need, um, you know, we were mentioning earlier, um, you know, in the UK, there's one planner to every 10,000 people, and that's considered a shortage. In Malaysia, there's one planner to every 100,000 people. There's, and these are some of those countries that have that massive disparity of professionals are where the most rapid urbanization is taking place. And you only get a chance to get it right once, really. So, you know, they really need to, they really need a lot of help. And so there's huge opportunity there for people to step up, take these roles and engage. And the other big challenge is a lot of people are retiring. You know, a lot of these professions are older professions or historic professions and lots of people are retiring. So there's a huge gap to be filled. And the people that are willing and eager, there's a real opportunity to step in and, you know, really grab a grasp of the reins and make a big impact. You know, and you're seeing it more and more. I'm meeting more and more people younger than me um, or a similar age that are in really senior positions. You know, I, there's one girl I hope really will come on the podcast. You know, she's involved in um, diplomacy for some of the Pacific Islands now and helping them with shipping and all of this type of thing, reducing emissions from shipping. So there's some really interesting people out there doing some incredible things. Um, and they're all surprising. A lot of them are surprisingly younger than you think. Well, the atmosphere is changing. Mm -hmm. The accent on diversity, inclu inclusion and equality is changing things. The accent on young people's presence is changing things. I'm glad to see all of this. And organizations like London National Park City and a lot of the local forums are so they're poised now to do more, to bring these sort of disparities between what is happening on the ground and policy-wise. Because one of the things when London National Park City started, we said that one of the things we want to happen is that citizens become more demanding. <laughs> now, now that 50% more of the wards support London National Park City, every citizen, especially in one of those wards, can go to the council and say, excuse me, I thought you were, you were supporting London National Park City. What's happening over there? Yeah. What are you doing? You know, yeah. you're supposed to be supporting this. So this kind of joining up, and I think that the UK as a whole is actually, I know where we still are such a mess and everything, but <laughs> compared to some countries, we are more mature politically. Yeah. We have thought about society and all those things for a long time. Our voices have got to be consciously stronger, mm -hmm. nationally and internationally, with, with especially towards COP26. We've got to speak up now. Mm -hmm. And we've got to have the confidence to shape democracy in the way that serves us. One of the things I always say to people about COVID that has taught us is that there's no such thing as no money. Mm. If you really need it because society is collapsing, government will get it. Mm. Look where all the money came from for the jabs, for all the things that we needed to do. Suddenly we had the money. We had to borrow it. But my goodness, isn't it better to be in debt in the future than to have no future at all? Yeah. Yeah. So this is a choice. You say to our politicians, yes, it's awful to be in debt, but it's even more awful to have no future at all. Mm -hmm. So let's do it. But there are other avenues. There's so much money in the world. There's no lack of money. Biden knows this. Mm -hmm. 3.5 trillion for a social program. Taxes for the rich. Mm -hmm. And that's just one program. And does it hurt the rich? No, it doesn't hurt them. But the benefit to society is enormous. We keep, need to have these sort of realizations that when we share, we can have a wonderful world. Indeed, but and a lot of the technologies we need for this greener future and to create opportunities like rewilding the countryside, you know, they can actually produce things more affordably. You know, if you look at, again, I've been, I've been reading a lot about it lately, but hydroponics and things, you know, there's a huge opportunity to create jobs in cities, producing very nutritious food, more nutritious than we're producing through current agricultural land, because things like broccoli have lost 70% of their nutritional content due to the degradation of our soils. So there has to be just a huge rethink. We were talking about this the other day with um, on timber, and there's a lot of new technology coming around of how we can use timber, and we can use it to create things like satellites, computer screens, we can 3D print, all with wood. So there's a huge opportunity, but we need the investment in the technology. And these are things to create huge amounts of jobs supporting, which all support these other objectives we have, like greening urban environments, because all that timber can be used. Producing food in cities means more jobs where people are, and it means more of these natural areas can be regenerated. So there's a lot of thought that needs to go into these things. 
um, and resources that need to be made available to do it. And look at with COVID is a really good opportunity because look how much office space there's going to be in cities now. We're going to see a huge transformation. We already are that lots of companies are not going back to the office. My company's a new generation company, shall we say? We don't. We've never had an office. We all work remotely. Um, we've just taken on new staff. They all work remotely. Um, you know, there may be a time when we need to meet up, but it may only be briefly. You know, for what once a week or once every few weeks. Um, and so far, you know, it's been working really, really well. And even big companies are doing the same thing. So there's going to be a lot of spaces within cities that need to be massively rethought. And they have to be focused on how do we support the community that's there? And how do we use this opportunity to foster more community and engage people and help people realize where things come from and all of this type of thing? And we just have to you know, make that investment because it will pay dividends in the end. And it will also not only create a more resilient um, community, but it'll create a more sustainable society as well. You know, it protects us from things like COVID where international shipping and things may become an issue. If something like this happens again, you know, our supply chains become damaged. There's a real opportunity to protect ourselves from that whilst also meeting many of these other challenges of, you know, climate change. In many ways, I think we don't congratulate people enough for what we have gone through in COVID. Yeah. You know, it's not just about ordinary citizens putting up with the fear of COVID and so on, but society itself managing change. Like you say, you know, the, the disappearance of the idea of the office. Mm -hmm. Well, people come in and fill the space. They say, oh, well, if we can't have that, we'll have to do something else, won't we? Mm -hmm. They're ready to change. And if we can see that, we can adapt to huge fundamental changes in our personal lives, in the way we run our lives, in the way we do things and so on, as well with organizational, societal and business structures and so on. If we can see that we're already doing that, let's be even braver and have a vision. Mm. We can have a vision in which we can promise most doable things that will end up with a superb green future, with a much happier life for everyone, but involving even more drastic change so that people become by hearing the story of themselves, how they've been able to adapt as business, as people, as teachers, as education and, and everything, that we are able to adapt, to have the confidence to take on and perhaps bear the pain of even more transition. But let's not go back. Mm. Now, let's not put back all the things that are un unsustainable. Let's not keep manufacturing things that we don't need. Yeah. Let's shut down those jobs. I know that when you say this, a lot of people say, oh my God, that's my job. I'm manufacturing something that's really not needed, but that's my job. You're asking mm. me to give up my livelihood. It's really big, mm. but my goodness, there's so many better things that we need as jobs. Green jobs that make our environment better. Green goods, all those things. The shift will be bewildering. People will be frightened. They'll have to give up their jobs and so on but better things are coming. And if we can really sell this story as what it is, which is absolutely possible green future, a marvelous green future, if we sell it right and are able to bear the transition and the difficulties and pull together as a society and the world, it will be really marvelous in the future. And that's what we need in our country and in COP26, we have to help each other, we have to share, we have to change the ways we live and, and think and so on. But if we can pull together, like you say, it's a wonderful world. The mm. technology is there, the intelligence is there, the people are there, the money is there, it's restructuring. We can have it all, you know. Yeah, we definitely can. It's just reaching out and taking it and moving forward. That's the challenge. So. I wanted to ask you a bit about how you've ended up where you are, because you've had quite an interesting, <laughs> an interesting life, really. Um, you know, you've been all over the world. Um, and I was just wondering if you could tell us a bit about that. And, you know, because you've just been awarded um, the Challenger Award from Vanity Fair. One of, is it eight women? One of eight women? Yes. Been selected for 2021. So it's a huge award um, and huge congratulations. So I just thought it'd be really interesting to hear a bit about how you've You've got to hear, you know, how have you ended up engaged with all these things? Because there might be people listening that really want to set up their own community group or charity or just do something in their local area. So it'd be interesting to see how you've ended up where you are and how you've influenced all these things. 
I think as a role model, there are certain messages in my life that are important. Firstly, I'm from a refugee family. My family ran out of China in the days when there was chaos, the aftermath of Mao and so on, in the British Hong Kong, a Hong Kong that you would never recognize. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm nearly 72 now, and when you think of my parents' generation, that's 100 years ago. Mm -hmm. The things that happened to them in their lifetime that ended them, them up as in their 30s, running into Hong Kong, losing all their friends, all their family. They tell us as a family that they don't know where they are. They say everyone is dead or lost. Mm -hmm. So we are a family without family history. Mm -hmm. I have no, no wife, stories to tell like yeah. about anybody. And they mm. refused to tell them. They were so traumatized. The philosophy, like many of traumatized refugee families, is don't look back. Mm. They actually said to us that you should go somewhere in the world, make your own life. Mm. So when I lived in Hong Kong, grew up in a country that in my childhood, who was like a 100% refugee country. Mm -hmm. We had nothing, the British were there. They thought to themselves, my God, what are we gonna do with all these people? They've run out with nothing in their hands and so on. They got to be fed and so on. They got to make something. Mm -hmm. So they taught the population to make things that the British then facilitated to sell all over the world. Mm -hmm. That was the beginning of Hong Kong's manufacturing life. And what we made, if you were old enough, once upon a time, the label made in Hong Kong meant rubbish. If you bought something made in Hong Kong, you can be assured it will break in the next five minutes. <laughs> but the British were there to sell it. <laughs> cheap. <laughs> it might break in five minutes, but it's cheap. And that was the beginning of us, and we ended up being a very skilled manufacturer, the capital of businesses across the world and all sorts of things in, in Hong Kong being a glitzy sort of center and so on, and now it has changed again. But I grew up in that unstable atmosphere in which every family said that if we had enough money, not rich, but if we had enough money, we want our children to have a better life, so we send them overseas. So I was one of those children. Mm -hmm. And I was sent to Australia all by myself without parents. Mm -hmm. And I made that decision when I was 14. I didn't know what I was talking about, to leave your family, go all by yourself to a foreign country. So I went to boarding school and I cried every night. <laughs> but every week I wrote home and told my parents I was very happy <laughs> because I was so privileged <laughs> to be one of the few people sent overseas. And I had huge culture shock when I arrived. I couldn't understand the Australian accent. I couldn't understand anybody for three months. Mm. and things like that. So I had a very sort of long and winding road of a great suffering of health problems, of cultural clash, and, and so on. And I moved from one country into another. When you read my CV, you sometimes, without knowing the details, think it's really glamorous. She went from Hong Kong, she went to Australia, she then went to West Berlin, and then she came to London. But if you know the truth, I was displaced from one country. I had no right to stay in any of those countries. So it is a journey in which by the time I came to Britain and I came here because I had no right to stay in West Berlin beyond a certain number of years. So I came to Britain, to London when I was 22 as an artist and a poet mm -hmm. and started my life. And when I came here, I didn't want to come here. I wanted to go to the United States, but they wouldn't let me in. They're <laughs> <So laughs> <No> lost. <laughs> I was stranded. I came to London to apply to go to the United States, but I was stranded here. Lo and behold, I liked it here. Mm -hmm. So I built my career here as an artist to start off with. And having been trained as a traditional Chinese artist when I was a little girl, mm -hmm. that was what I did. It was a very communal context for an artist in China, not an individualist idea like in the West. So I felt very lonely as an artist in the West. Mm -hmm. So I decided to become a community artist. And mm -hmm. that is when I came across nature and the conditions of ethnic minority in this country. And in my 30s, I became very socially committed. 
I just dropped everything in the arts, although I was doing quite well. And my friends were very shocked. They said, Julie, how can you do this? How can you drop being an artist? And for me, it was always so clear that creativity is not just in the arts. Mm -hmm. It might be in the art products, mm -hmm. but it's not in the arts, it's in the person. Mm -hmm. So I could pour all my creativity into the environment, making the moves that enable minorities to become part of the mainstream environmental sector. So that's the story of how I came to be with them. It's really interesting, a very um, varied, varied life. And then, yeah, it's amazing how people can come from um, such difficult backgrounds and come to do such amazing things. You know, my wife's um, someone I really admire, for obvious reasons, not just because she's my wife, but um, you know, <laughs> she's originally from Chernobyl um, and her family lived just outside Chernobyl when all of that went up. And if you've seen the Chernobyl series, um, where they go in and there's the old lady there and they go in and they kill all the animals and burn all the farm oh. down and everything. That all happened to her family. Um, and because she's from um, what was the Soviet Union, she was born just before the Soviet Union collapsed. You know, they went through all the tragedy of that. Um, they lost a lot of family members in the war and they don't really know much history past their grandma. They know it's up to their grandma pretty much and that's kind of, kind of it really. There's no records or anything. So there she comes from a very difficult background and they were sort of subsistence. They were moved just outside what's now the exclusion zone and had kind of, um, you know, some sort of subsistence farming, sort of early upbringing, I would say. Um, and then luckily, you know, she had, she moved, her sister moved to Russia and she was able to move to Russia because her sister was there and because she was originally in Belarus. Um, well, what became Belarus after the Soviet Union fell. Um, and then luckily she was able to come and study here. So, you know, she had a quite a, she was very fortunate in the end and she's you know happy to stay here for, for the moment at least um so you know she's been very fortunate in in her lifestyle but her ambition is above and beyond pretty much anybody else i've ever met and a lot of people i've met from more disadvantaged backgrounds like i met um some people from serbia who are really you know in um, eastern europe hungary and places like that and a lot of them are the, the hungriest people are the most ambitious people I've met, but in a very compassionate way, you know, they really want to have an impact on, on all of these things. So it's, it's, it's so terrible that people go through these things, but at the same time, it can create such incredible people. You know, adversity breeds such an incredible mentality and, and, and attitude that can be, you know, achieve such wonderful things. Absolutely. And you know, the ethnic minorities of this country, to be an ethnic minority is to have suffered. Mm. And the suffering continues of racism and discrimination and so on. That's why the Black Lives Matter movement is so important, to drive the urge to work for diversity, equality, inclusion. But people like us in this country, especially at COP26, we are the people poised to talk about the world. Mm -hmm. You know, every ethnic minority is connected through their country of heritage with some country in the world. We are the world news, mm -hmm. but with a difference. It is about us. It's personal. Mm -hmm. World news is personal. Wildfires are personal. Flooding in Bangladesh is personal. All these things mean that at COP26, we are the voices. Mm -hmm. And if they're listened to by the British mainstream, it brings them so much closer to identifying with the world. Mm -hmm. And it's that identification with the world that will get us over all the global north and global south and all this other stuff. Let's have one world. Mm -hmm. It's very late in the day. It's always saying, you know, let's do something with climate emergency and so on. But it's so late that mm. in many respects, it's already too late. Yeah. Some of the things that we thought we would see in years to come, we're seeing now, it is too late. Mm -hmm. But let's stop. Mm -hmm. Let's not get worse. Yeah. It is terrifying. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you think of, all the, the industries that want to pollute through the formula of net zero, what we need is real zero, mm. where we stop all the carbon. The thing of net zero sometimes is a loophole. People say, oh, we can continue to pollute. We'll promise you millions of trees. Mm -hmm. And those trees will not even do their job until decades to come. It's very mm. much delayed while the carbon is still going into the air. And because so they don't burn down on the process. Yes. Mm. And all that, that stuff about planting trees and so on, 
I hope someone is actually calculating how much carbon is going into the air from the wildfires. Mm. They've just calculated just for Siberia that the carbon released in Siberia through the burning of forests is twice the national emissions of Austria <laughs> for the whole year. <laughs> it's for two years. <laughs> so we're talking about mitigation through planting trees. We are burning our old forests mm. through what we're doing. So it's become really urgent. So part of the message of these three crises of COVID, climate change, and diversity and so on, one world, let's take care of each other. Mm -hmm. The urgency of the message. And the third is, come on, we have the technology. Yeah. We have the money. We have the food. We have, the we skills. have everything. We have the skills. We have the people. Let's do it together. Mm -hmm. One great opportunity we have at the present time is green recovery and green jobs in this country. Mm -hmm. The UK has signed up legally to deliver net zero by 2030 and then another target 2050. As a result of that, part of it is green jobs as part of the solution. So this is different. It's not a nicety. The government is not doing this because it feels like, you know, let's create more jobs and, and, and so on. It has to do this as part of the solution to deliver legally net zero. So we have a great opportunity for all of us to take part. At the moment, I'm chairing something called the Green Apprenticeship Advisory Panel. And we've been tasked with supporting the Green Jobs Task Force to create the situation in which green jobs are supported and expand in our industry. So the government is looking to employers to speak up and say, what are the green jobs you think you need in mm -hmm. order to deliver net zero? What can your profession do in order to do that? Tell us and we will create apprenticeship standards and you can also create all kinds of training, placements and so on to move us towards the volume of green jobs that will help to deliver net zero. So in your profession, you have always been telling me now that you don't have enough landscape architects. Well, this is a moment. <laughs> and all other sectors as well, they need to look hard. What are the green jobs we wish we had? And government, can they help us? We need to tell them how they can help us to help them deliver. Definitely. And apprenticeships offer a huge advantage. I mean, looking back, I would probably choose an apprenticeship over university because it, I think you learn so much more working. Um, and actually, again, I know a lot of people that are really reluctant to go to university because of fees, um, COVID, you know, a lot of universities are still doing things online and people are not interested. So this gives you a totally different experience. Um, you'll learn a lot more. And um, I think people are just, you know, looking for an alternative now. You know, people, times are getting harder and people want to be able to earn a bit and have be a bit more responsible. And this offers a huge opportunity to do that. We're really lucky in the landscape world because we now have two apprenticeships. Um, I think it's a level three and a level seven. So you can do an A-level equivalent apprenticeship and a master's level apprenticeship, um, which is you know hugely valuable for people that want to change careers or, or anything else. So there's a huge opportunity to come into these professions. But what's also really important is, is the broadening of these professions. You know, we've, we've traditionally had things so siloed as we've already talked about. Um, and actually there's loads of skills that are missed out. You know, you, let's use landscape architects as an example. You know, landscape architecture traditionally has been a very specific thing, but actually that thing is so broad and it's only getting broader. People are doing the job really that actually use totally different skill sets to what traditionally would have been used. So we need to look at that and think, okay, well, what, what new things do we need for the future? You know, my company, we're doing VR at the moment and we're using VR as a way to communicate with communities during COVID because actually we can drop people into the site, they can look around, we can build 3D models of it that are pretty realistic um, and they can see what it's gonna be like. So that's a, been a really important tool for community engagement going forward. And it's gonna be an even, an even more important tool as it gets better and better and we use it more and more. And we're using it on a huge amount of projects now to sell schemes and help people understand that it allows people to go, as you said, you know, but what are you doing that for? Why haven't you done this instead? You know, and that's really important. It's really important to have that. And you often things are raised that, you know, you might not have considered because you're never, you're never going to know everything. Um, you know, and these things, these things are all changing. Like even forestry, you know, forestry, there's a lot more community forestry. Forestry and agriculture are going to start, you know, 
really coming together in the next few years, you know, because it has to, you know, we have to start looking at agroforestry and rewilding. And those two professions have got to knit together, but there's no place for people who really cross over, you know, they still have to kind of be in two camps and, you know, there needs to be an opportunity for skills that can cross over much more easily. And, you know, my, I come from a very varied background in terms of the environment. You know, I started in a voluntary sector, I volunteered for a year for the Wildlife Trust and lots of community projects, living landscape projects. Then I went and studied forestry. Then I went into, um, well, I, I dropped out of school, um, out, of, out of college, and then volunteered and they got me back into education, so I went and studied forestry. And then I worked on a farm for a little while, looking at sustainable agriculture and how we can introduce trees on the farm and all this type of thing. Um, and then I worked um, for an ecology company doing habitat restoration and habitat management for big developments and how we kind of put the, put the practical side of it, like going and actually planting the trees and things. And through that, I found out about landscape. I was working on a flood remediation scheme at Gatwick Airport um, where they were doing these big flood defenses and restructuring a river system and creating a big basin and flood meadows and all of this type of thing. Um, and then I found out about landscape and I thought, well, landscape actually ties a lot of these things I was interested in together because it's kind of has that overview. It's very varied and it kind of gave me the opportunity to kind of take those expertise into an area and sort of try and design solutions, putting lots of different bits together. And I realized I kind of lacked the urban design side. I had a lot of rural um, skills, but I didn't really have urban. So then I did a master's in landscape and urban design. And that route, that varied route, isn't appreciated in a lot of um, traditional, um, how we say, routes into professions, because they want you to have a very linear path. They want you to do um, landscape, landscape, and then you become a part of that profession. And personally, I think that absolutely has to change. You know, and it is changing, luckily, in our profession, but other professions, I think, have to look at it similarly. You know, um, and actually it has to be supportive of that range of skill sets, because you, we need that range of skill sets. Things are becoming much more varied, um, and the diversity of projects is becoming much more complex. You know, projects are becoming more complex, and we have to work with such a range of factors that, as I said before, it's, it's not just about knowing what you can do, it's about knowing who stands next to you. And if you have an understanding of what they do, it makes the whole working relationship much better. So people with this varied range of skills have become more and more important to kind of be the mediators and come in and sit there with all these other experts and say, well, actually, okay, I understand where you're coming from, but actually you haven't considered what these guys are saying because you need to do this to factor in this, you know, and that's happening more and more. And those sort of people are gonna be really valuable and really needed. So it's how we prepare ourselves for that as well. I think that the attitudes towards what a job is and so on is so important. Mm. Not just to get money, but what kind of life you get. When I was a young artist making no money, what really made me as a person was to do any odd job to mm. make money in order to be an artist. I was an interpreter in the NHS. I coloured in drawings for architects. <laughs> you know? I did windows, shop windows, all sorts of things. I, I did surveys in communities, all sorts of things to make money and, and so on. And these things made me. I mm. met people in many different circumstances and I was able to think in many ways. And, and it takes time, you know, as a, as a young person, you never know where you end up. Mm. You know, who would have thought I would have ended up being who I am now? Exactly. You know, starting off, think of being an artist, and then I studied architecture and, and abandoned that, although I was nearly finishing. I was so clear about what I did not want mm. as much as what I wanted. But you had to get in there before you know. You do, absolutely. You know? So being able to have that confidence that society will hold you and give you something that is structure. So one of the structures at the moment that's getting better and better is apprenticeship. Mm. A few years ago, it wasn't this good. Yeah. Now they have really structured it well. And a lot of people don't know what an apprenticeship standard is. There's a difference between any apprenticeship and an apprenticeship standard. An apprenticeship standard is an apprenticeship that lasts more than 12 months. Otherwise, it cannot be called a standard. Mm -hmm. And it is called the gold standard of training. It is put together by employers who are convinced they want a certain type of person with this range of skills for the jobs they want. And that's why it's important at the moment 
the apprenticeship panel that I'm chairing at the moment is saying to employers, come to us with the apprenticeships, the serious things you want to see in your area that you think would deliver net zero. So we're mm. asking all these sectors, think about it, come to us if you think there's something, we'll work at it together. It's not a quick fix. I mean, it takes about two years, maybe a little bit less, to put an apprenticeship standard together. But there's also a structure for it. There's an apprenticeship levy fund, mm. and employers who have a spending, a turnover of more than three million in employing people have to pay into it, and they draw from it free to train new people. But employers who don't have that amount of money can draw on it for free to train people for these professions. So that's a great facility. And now it's becoming even more flexible. Just a week ago, the, the government announced they put seven million into what they call flexi apprenticeships, where you can move from one employee to another, making up an apprenticeship in the creative industries. Mm. So government is seeking now to really put into place a strengthening of apprenticeship as an opportunity. Very high standard. In an apprenticeship, you'll be spending about 20% of your time studying college or something like that as well. A mixture of experience and studying, guidance, real work. So you're very much in the real world and it's actually very exciting to be an apprentice. So all these things are things we look forward to as part of delivering net zero that is going to be a structure in the near future. So I hope people actually who are parents, who are teachers, who are employees and so on, to get themselves looking forward to a wave of green jobs. The government is expecting something like two million new green jobs. That's hell oh, of wow. a lot that of jobs. That is an awful lot of jobs, yeah. And young people need to hear what they are. Mm. A lot of youngsters, they cannot name the green jobs, you know? Well, Teachers can't of, name the green jobs. Indeed, I'd never heard of forestry exactly. or landscape architecture. Exactly. Um, or even urban design until, you know, I was in the professions. Yeah. I'd already started doing conservation work. And people don't know that a lot of green jobs are supporting jobs where you'll be working in the digital world, in yeah, communications, in dealing with data sets, in planning out the, the organization, the structure and the money and everything. So there's a lot coming. So there is. expect this. Well, it's everything from technology to management to the hands-on side of things to the design, um, you know, to the really technical Nature. detail. Yeah, exactly. Community engagement. There's such a range of things. Green that we lifestyles. Have to exactly. Green products. Exactly. Exactly. So there's a huge range of things. Yeah. And um, now is a really, really exciting time. Yeah. It's a, we're at a key moment. Attenborough yes. says a hinge moment. We're at a moment where it can all go hopefully very well <laughs> <laughs> or it can all go terribly wrong. Let's hope. Let's err on the side of hope, shall we? A lot um, of things have already collapsed, you know, things like mm. office space and so on. And you find people have more initiative than you think. They want to move in different directions. There are lots of different directions. Well, it's a bright future. COVID's driven everyone to rethink how they live their lives and what they want from their lives. And I think that's an opportunity to absolutely embrace and you know drive forward because it's such a huge possibility for people. As we talked about purpose, all of this type of thing, there's a huge issue globally we need to tackle. And if people can put their time and energy and will into that, you know, it's going to be transformative for everyone, society Absolutely. and nature. So it's people, place and nature. So it's, it's going to be moment. vital. It is. And I just want to say thank you so much for, <laughs> for coming on. Absolutely fantastic to have you and see you in the flesh again. And um, I really look forward to catching up with you again soon. Thanks a lot. You're welcome. I hope you've enjoyed this episode. If you're interested in finding out more about how the environment and society are interlinked, then maybe check out our episode with Tapua where we talk about water security and designing with the environment in mind. Don't forget to like, subscribe and share to friends and colleagues who might also be interested. And a huge thank you to our sponsor, Beans Accountants, and our incredibly kind supporters, Gillian Goodson Designs and Birmingham Botanical Gardens. Mm -hmm.